Thank you very much, everybody, for um, joining this afternoon and, and picking our talk. Um, so this afternoon, we would like to talk for an hour and a half about static analysis, how to apply static analysis. Um, my name is Matthias Madu, and, and this is Dan. Maybe we can introduce ourselves first. So my name is uh, Matthias Madu. I currently work for Inviso, um, which is a pure play security company uh, located in Brussels. Um, why, why do I want to talk about static analysis? Well, I, I, I have a history of static analysis. Um, I joined Fortify uh, eight years ago, um, and, and I was fortunate to work on their static analysis solution. Um, I've, I've also done other stuff during my time at, at Fortify, like for, inc for instance, um, I was fortunate to join BSIM. Uh, BSIM is a uh, a maturity model where we actually are going to companies and we're going to figure out how they do uh, software security and, and what works for them and what does not work for them. And through that initiative, I was fortunate to, to look at uh, static analysis solutions, both through BSIM and both through my uh, former employer, to look at static analysis solutions at, at uh, fairly large organizations, let's say, um, and, and figure out what they did, how stuff works for them and how stuff does not work for them. Um, at Inviso, uh, we are doing consulting, and in my role, I also try to apply that knowledge that I've learned uh, throughout the last um, eight years um, to the financial industry here, here in Belgium, and, and figuring out for the financials, like how can we improve their uh, software security uh, uh, model in, in general? How can we uh, make sure that they are successful with a static analysis solution? Uh, how can we do threat modeling for them? Um, in general, how can we help them making being successful with, with software security? Yeah, my name is Dan. Um, I'm also a colleague of, of Matthias at Enviso. I've liked computers for, for a while now. That's a picture of me together with my sister, me driving the computer. Um, my focus at Enviso is really on security assessments. So I focus on pen testing, source code reviews, uh, both on mobile um, and desktop platforms mainly for financial industries. Um, we have a few smaller clients in Belgium, but our focus is really uh, on the banking sector. <coughs> uh, I also drive research and development at Enviso. Uh, last year, we focused a lot on malware analysis. This year, we're focusing a bit more uh, on forensics, um, intelligence gathering, incident response, uh, more a uh, bit of the novel uh, security services. Um, so today, I'd like to compliment Matthias talk and, uh, and co-present Really hope you don't fall asleep in this session after a heavy lunch. So we really do our best to, uh, uh, to make it an interactive session. And uh, the first attempt to uh, make it interactive and, and make sure you do not fall asleep is, um, we, I would like to go quickly around in the room and, and figure out like what kind of company do you work for, who you are of course, what kind of company do you work for, um, and, and in terms of static analysis, we, we just would like to get a, a feel for the audience. Um, we have a lot of material in this deck and we can spend more time on one or the other topic. So we would like to fine tune a little bit our, our presentation towards the audience. So if you don't mind, uh, we, we would like to go quickly around. Uh, where are you from? Uh, what kind of company do you work for? Do you have hands-on static analysis uh, uh, experience? And if so, what kind of experience? Um, and, and what if you if you already know what you would like to get out of this session, please let us know so that we can fine tune our uh, our presentation. Um, thank you very much. As as um, as you can see, there's a very broad range of people from no experience at all to no experience at all, just out of general interest, up until people that built their own static analysis solution. Um, so it, it's going to be quite challenging to focus on one or the other subject, but uh, we'll do our best to make sure that there's something for everybody in here. Um, and definitely the, the pointers like how can we improve static analysis and stuff like that, uh, we, we will definitely touch on that and we, we, we will try to help. Um, one thing I would like to make clear is um, I have a history of Fortify, but I, I in, in, in no way am I'm still attached to Fortify. So um, just to make that clear, um, uh, it's, it's a general, talk about static analysis, um, which can be found in the, in the Fortify solution, but it can definitely be found in all the other vendors' solutions, all right? Um, let's, let's, let's go through some 
general introduction uh, on, 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 on software security and, and uh, on, on issues. Um, what we found in the, in the last couple of years um, is that SQL injection is, is still a problem in this world. Um, SQL injection is a bug that was found a long time ago, over a decade ago. Um, we know how to remediate SQL injection, but still people are making the same mistakes over and over and over again. And, and SQL injection is, is one of the main problems or, or one of the uh, uh, problems that can cause the most damage as can be seen over here. Heartland, Heartland uh, payment systems had a, had a huge SQL injection issue in 2009. Cost of the breach, 140 million. It's not small. You would think like, hey, other people would definitely start picking this up and say, hey, we have to make sure that something like SQL injection, whatever it is, is not in our code. Um, unfortunately, it's not the case. Unfortunately, people are making the same mistakes in different companies over and over and over again. Um, why are we making the same problem? Um, a little bit the problem of software security is really you have the developers and, and you have IT security. And if you're talking about software security and you ask the developers like, hey, who is doing software security in your organization? Well, they say like, well, security, that's, that's in the IT department. You know, you have to, don't ask us. We, we, we are just coding the features and we just make sure that everything works and security that goes over to the IT department. And then if you go to the IT department and you ask like, hey, uh, security, software security, are you guys involved in, in, in really making sure that the software is coded in the right way and stuff like that? And they're like, software? No, we're, we're not doing anything about software and, and definitely not something about software security. It's these developers that you have to ask uh, how they do software security. So in the end, who's responsible? Well, nobody, right? There's nobody in the middle in between developers and IT security when they're pointing to each other. The bottom line is, it's everybody's job. Um, it's not only the developer's job, but it, it has to really be in the organization itself because if developers want to do the right thing, but they are not given the time to do the right thing, well, then it's very hard for them to succeed in their, in their, in their mission, okay? So essentially, in an organization, from top to bottom, everybody has to believe in software security because it will have an impact on, on the time it takes to create a product, to create a secure product. Okay, so it, it's something that has to be adopted from, from top to bottom in an organization. So, um, is it still a problem? What, what are the, the security implications? What is software security? If, if we talk about really um, code, and if I would ask people in the room over here, uh, at your organization, what are you going to do next? Are you going to produce next year more code? or are you going to produce less code than what you currently have? I think none, of, none in this room will say, well, we, ha we will have less code next year, right? So code is building up. We're building on top of existing systems. We're building on top of code that was written a decade ago, which was not built with security in mind. And, and we're building up, and we are not even thinking about that, that we still rely on these systems that were built not with security in mind. So on the right over here, you see just the code that in, in a Windows system, it, it grew uh, very rapidly over time. And on the left-hand side, you just see the, 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 the CVEs, the number of CVE entries, uh, common vulnerability enumeration. So the number of problems that there are. So as you can see, there's, there's definitely a correlation between uh, the number of, of vulnerabilities in code and the, the, the lines of code that pr we produce today. One thing I would like to make clear over here is that some people say, well, software security, oh, we have something like, like security software that must be the same thing just in the reverse order, but must be very, very related. Um, it is not, it is, it is not. People that say, well, we, uh, we have anti-key loggers, we have anti-spyware, um, we have an antivirus, we have all these security software products that makes us secure, you know, from, from, from start to finish. That's not what we're talking about. We are really talking about producing secure code from the design phase up until you release a product, you have to think about security. And, and static analysis is only one thing that you can do throughout this secure development life, life cycle to improve your code from a security perspective. And I found this one a really interesting graphic. Uh, it's, it's, uh, what, what I've looked up over here is really the lines of code in, in, the, in the Windows products again, but 
I've added on some. So in the previous slide, it was up until XP, but then I moved on. I, I figured out when the Gates memo was, was um, published. So when Gates said like, hey, we really have to uh, make sure that, that our, 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 our software is secure from, from start to finish. We are, as Microsoft, we are really going to do a push and produce a secure software. And that, I've, I've set this out against the CVE numbers, against the specific versions of Microsoft. And as you can see over here, um, I would say they, they are very successful, Microsoft, with their, with their SDLC and, and how they approach security. So this memo came out a little bit after XP in 2002. And, and as you can see, the number of CVE numbers on these specific products drastically reduced uh, over time. Um, the number of lines of code seems to be staying quite the same, but really the number of CVE numbers, the number of problems in the code goes down drastically. So I found that very, very interesting. I think um, it's sometimes very hard to quantify, like, hey, does my software security program work? How, how do you quantify that? Well, I think this is some sort of an example of, of where they did it on large scale within an organization, and there's actually some proof that it, that it works. Um, last but not least, why are we talking about static analysis? Um, some people say, well, we, we do pen testing and, and uh, we are very good at that. We, we, we have an expert team of pen testers and they found really, really cool stuff and, and then we fix that. Um, that's fine, but that's very good. However, um, you have to also look at the economics. If, if pen testers find something, it's very late in the cycle. If it, if it happens in production, it's, it's even worse, you know? And, and fixing something late in the cycle tends to be expensive. You have to go back to your developers. You have to ask for changes. Uh, these changes need to be validated. The QA goes around this stuff. And all this whole cycle is, is moving, you know, and it takes time to get something fixed. So essentially, it takes time. The later in the cycle you fix something, uh, the more it costs. With static analysis, you're going to incorporate a solution or, or uh, a mechanism when developers are coding and you're going to give them feedback on how they are doing. And essentially you're going to help him uh, on, on coding the right stuff. So over time, if they are using a static analysis solution and if they are uh, fed some feedback on how they are doing, they essentially are going to produce more secure code. And that's very, very more cost efficient than finding stuff late in the cycle. Um, all right, so why do we want to audit code? Um, uh, just a, a quick example on uh, why we want to do that. There's a couple of ways of auditing code. Um, some people believe in tools, so tools is just, you, you buy a solution, you run that on your application, and it's gonna produce some results. Other people believe more in peer-to-peer -peer reviews, all right, where they're just gonna go through the code, they're gonna read the code, so just to make sure that everybody uh, get the basics right. Static analysis is where you look at the code without executing the code. Okay, so this is the really fundamental thing that you have to get right. So static analysis is you have the code printed out, I don't know, in your IDE, you're not running it, you're just looking at the code, you try to figure out where the problems are in that piece of code. That is static analysis. So how can you do that? You can do that manually, by reading the code, but eventually you see some patterns and you can say, well, maybe I can code that up in, into a, some automated way, into a solution that automatically finds already these, these basic things that I'm otherwise looking for, right? So that's a little bit the, 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 the shift, the, the idea of, of static analysis. Eventually, you're gonna produce some results, right? So, and, and if you're gonna use a solution, um, some people may already have seen, if you've never thought about security and you unleash a security a, a, a solution on your on your code that it comes back with with thousands of vulnerabilities right um, and 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 you 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 may think like well that that's 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 really really curious right because um, everything seems to work fine you know all the features work but there's like thousands and thousands of problems um, there's one person that has to figure out what needs to be fixed you know um, and that's a very, very important job. So one person looks at all the issues and, and figures out like, well, are we going to fix these bunch of, of vulnerabilities or are, go are we going to focus on something else? A very important job, why? Um, 
first of all, if you make a bad decision, if you say, well, we're going to focus on, on these group of vulnerabilities and the developers need to fix that, and turns out these problems are not really problems, the developers are going to be really pissed. They're going to come back at you and say, well, we have to fix something. It's not an issue. It's not a problem. Why are we doing this? Okay. Um, and, and, and that's sometimes a problem. So for the people that try to introduce static analysis, there were a couple of people that say, well, we were thinking about static analysis. Um, that's very important to, to keep in mind. If you're going to introduce a static analysis solution to your developers, um, do not throw everything at them. You know, Think really, really hard about what you're going to give them at first that are real issues and that they need to fix. Um, the other thing is even worse. You know, you, you, you pick a, a problem and you say, well, it can wait. You know, we, we're not going to tackle this particular problem right now. Um, that's problematic because if, if or if even, even worse, if you say, well, it's not an issue. We are not going to fix that because for our organization, it's not, it's not a problem. Like, for instance, take SQL injection. It may be the case that your organization says, well, SQL injection, well, we do not really care about that. We care more about other uh, vulnerabilities. If that's the case, um, well, you, you give some free stuff to, to the attackers, right? Uh, the vulnerability is there. The attacker will be happy to take advantage of that particular vulnerability. Uh, a, a, a really interesting case on, on how to decide, like, when to act on a problem is, is the target case. Um, the target case, what's, what's the problem? Um, maybe you've... Maybe very quickly, yeah, sorry. has anyone heard of this case before? Yeah, a few people. Okay, so uh, uh, what, what, this is the story a little bit on, on why it's important to, to, to make the right decision at the right time. So over here on, on November 30, um, hackers were able to get into the target system um, and were setting up their, their kind of escape plan. You know, they, they were going after the credit cards and, and they said, well, now that we found the credit cards, they were in the network, now that we found the credit cards, we need a way to get these credit cards out of the system, okay? And while doing that, they were actually spotted. They were spotted by um, FireEye that was able to say, well, oh, there's something happening over there. Um, we, we really have to take action right now because they're, they're setting their, their systems. And, and FireEye spotted that and, and gave an alert to Bangalore. Bangalore flagged it to the security system in Minneapolis and eventually nothing happened. Minneapolis decided that it was not really urgent to fix that particular problem. Um, and so they were actually aware of the problem, but they didn't do anything. Uh, in the end, I think uh, interesting data over here is that it costed Target 162 million uh, to fix this particular problem. So if they had acted on that immediately, that would have saved them 162 million. I think that's a, a huge number. So that's roughly four dollars per credit card number that they stole. Um, and the, the defense of target is, is also very interesting. Um, you have all these statistics like, hey, uh, a bug gets found 200 days after it was created and stuff like that. What target said like, well, we actually found this very quickly. Even 12 days after we were able to find this particular problem. Well, if it's 200 days or 12 days after, it doesn't matter, right? They, they lost their data. Um, so they, they didn't act quick enough. Secure development life cycle, I think we can go over this um, uh, fairly quickly, uh, just in, in time sake, so that we can go to the meat of this presentation. Um, static analysis, I think, uh, one second. Um, I'll, I'll just gonna skip this particular portion. I do not really wanna go. Okay, so in, in SDLC, secure development life uh, cycles, I think you've already heard some talks about SDLC, so I, my assumption is that you've already touched on that. Um, there's a couple of models, and, and, and um, what I would like to go in here very, very briefly is, is the Microsoft Secure Software Development Life Cycle. Uh, where does static analysis fit in here? So if you, if you have a look at the SDLC, and if, the, if you have a look at the Microsoft SDLC, Somewhere in the middle, they're talking about implementation, right? So somewhere in the middle, they talk about like, hey, we're going to implement and use uh, secure coding standards. Uh, one of the things they say is like, well, you cannot use dangerous functions. This is exactly what a static analysis solution will go after, 
Okay, so static analysis really fits in here where, where static analysis, manual code review or automated code review will inspect the code. It will try to figure out what the code, um, uh, how it is coded and will figure out if there are problems with this uh, piece of code. All right, yeah. and I'll hand over to Dan. Yeah, thanks Matthias. Um, so that was the first part. I think we can now deep dive a bit into, yeah, sorry to the technicalities of the, the presentation. So first of all, who has a very clear definition in his mind of a bug and a flaw, and a defect, what the differences are? No? Okay, I think we picked the right section to put in the presentation. Um, so bug and flaw, let's set a few uh, semantics right. So they're both cases of defects. Uh, if we're talking about a bug, we're really talking about an imp implementation level problem. Uh, so software problem. Bugs, they happen at the level of source code, right? <coughs> On the other hand, we have flaws. Flaws are really instantiated in the design phase. They will manifest itself in the source code because somehow they need to appear uh, in, in the application. But the root cause of a flaw is much earlier in the SDLC. It's really in the design of the application. Let's look at a few examples. I think a picture says more than a thousand words. So a bug, well, a simple mistake, an error. I think by design, this was not really the intention, right? So the person that put up that handlebar might have had a bad day, a bad morning, and did some kind of uh, wrong implementation there, to put it in software terms. On the other hand, the design of this cabinet looks pretty bad. It looks to be installed quite correctly. The cabinet fits right. But Anyway, no matter how you implement this, no matter how you install it, the design was wrong from the start. I think that gives a very simple but very clear uh, difference between both defects, so a bug and a flaw. Two very important categories. Today, we're mainly going to tackle bugs, uh, and in a few slides, we'll see why. Taking that a bit more to a technical level, bugs and flaws in software applications, I think you know most of these categories, so SQL injection, uh, persistent cross-site scripting, reflective cross-site scripting, those kinds of things, typical bugs in a web application. What could be the root cause? Well, incorrect uh, input validation. By design, probably, there was the idea to do correct uh, validation of anything that arrives in the application. If that's implemented incorrectly, we're talking about bugs. Now, going to flaws. A few examples there, well, missing authentication. What will you see at the level of the source code? Well, you won't see any authentication routines. Why? Well, there might be not a single spec doc or design document uh, illustrating why you should have authentication. So that could be a flaw. There's a few other here. Uh, for example, creating and using your own crypto libraries. Still something that we see from time to time. It's quite problematic. Um, who here has implemented crypto himself or herself? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, legit, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you guys should, other, otherwise you're not doing your job probably. <laughs> uh, so you're excluded from the, the hall of shame. Um, another example that's on here is privacy violations. It's a bit more nuanced, I would say, a bug or a flaw. Can anyone give an example of a privacy violation that would be a bug or a flaw? Any suggestions? Who can think of a bug, a privacy violation? For example, yeah, sorry? Yeah, a SQL injection could result in the disclosure of sensitive information. So the impact could be very much related to, uh, to privacy. Um, another example there is, well, let's start with the flaw. It's possible that in the design documentation, it says, look, everything that is going through the application should be locked, should be persisted uh, to the local disk. Well, in case the application is handling credit card information, that's a privacy violation. Now, on the other hand, the design documentation might say, be careful with credit cards, only lock the first uh, or the last four digits, which is quite uh, often the case. And then the implementation might be wrong and it might just disclose the entire credit card number in the log file. That's the example of how that same privacy, privacy violation sorry, could manifest itself as a bug in a software product. 
So which ones do you think is more common? Which category? Bugs or flaws? Bugs? Who thinks bugs? Yeah, who thinks flaws? You would say 50-50, okay. 40-40? <laughs> Back to school after the, the session? <laughs> yeah. Don't use that guy's hash functions. Uh, so 50-50, okay. What is your, your motivation to saying that? Is it your own experience, 50-50? Okay. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> so 50-50 indeed, I think the statistic is coming from the same uh, source. Um, two more common technical examples here, heartbleed. I feel a bit bad for putting the author of the heartbleed bug on the slide, but he admitted it himself, so I think he would find it still okay. Um, a very small piece of code um, with an insecure memory operation basically resulted in maybe the biggest bug uh, of the decade. Huge impact, uh, a lot of servers were, um, were affected by this. And then a flaw, Microsoft Bob, I really like this one. Uh, who knows Microsoft Bob? That's a really old, you know it a bit? <laughs> You've seen it? I hope you never had to use it. Um, it's a very early version of Microsoft Windows. Basically it was the desktop was a room or a house filled with rooms and then you needed to click, for example, on the library room and then you could uh, start Word. So extremely difficult to use for, uh, for our generation, but it was uh, made to help older people uh, work with the computer. When you wanted to log in in Microsoft Bob and you forgot your password, you could type it in three times incorrectly and then this nice little dog, Bob, would appear on the screen and say, hey, it looks like you forgot your password please enter a new one <laughs> without asking your, uh, your original password, of course. I think that's broken by design, so that's a good example of a flaw uh, in that case. The impact might be a bit uh, different for both examples, but again, it's, it's a good illustration of, uh, of what we're talking about here. The first actual case of a bug, so that's from 1947 in a very huge relay computer um, one of, of the operators, and yes, the service really had operators that couldn't work with the machine but needed to maintain the hardware. They opened it up, there was a short circuit, and there was a mod removed from, uh, from this, and a small note was sticked in the, in the log file, saying, well, it's the first actual case of a bug being found. It's right here. So that's where, where the name comes from. Uh, a bit more serious, this example of the Ariana 5 launch failure. Uh, there's a small GIF here. Luckily, there was no, uh, no one on board. It was yeah, an extremely expensive mishap. So the, ves the vessel was going off course. There was a problem with the velocity sensors. Basically, security assertions were disabled for performance reasons. So that's a bug. And one of the velocity sensors um, did an incorrect cost from a 64-bit to a 16-bit. Um, type and then 30 seconds or a bit more after launch the vessel completely veered of course and the self-destruct mechanism um, engaged so there's a small graph here of what happened result 370 million dollars it's quite a, a huge impact <coughs> the single line of, of, uh, of instructions here that caused this so it was really a costing problem from from a 64-bit to a 16-bit signed integer that caused an overflow. That was the first bug. But then the fact that security assertions were disabled for performance reasons in production, obviously this is production. Um, that's probably the worst. There was the voting mechanism that could disable that kind of mishap uh, was completely disabled too. Um, and this resulted in 370 million. So quite a big price tag. Uh, for one line of code. Don't know what happened to the engineer that wrote this. Um, there's also quite a big difference in finding bugs and flaws when you're talking about these two classes of defects. Uh, you might have experience with a few of these uh, techniques listed on the, on the slide. So first of all, bugs. Typically in an IDE, you're going to have integrated support to, uh, to catch these uh, very quickly during development. There are some scanning solutions, static and dynamic, which we'll cover further in the session. 
compiler tools, and also peer review. Not sure who of you has experience reviewing code of your peers? Yeah? Okay. Is it something you only do for security critical code or is it a, a fixed practice in your company? Can you, yeah, fix for every line of code? Is, is it functional or security wise? Okay. But, but you're leaving it for, for security purposes or also for functional purposes? Because there's, there's a lot yeah. of reviewing going on, but mainly you have like some list of functional things that need to work and not really security implications. Mainly functional. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, about, uh, is it more functional? More functional, yeah. Functional, yeah. We, let's say, for more technical pieces of code, we sometimes uh, need to secure code review, but then we need to write a special code. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks, thanks for that. So typically, this happens later in the SDLC. If we're talking about IDE tools, peer review, we need a basic set of code in order to do our review. Um, sorry for that. With flaws, we can do it a bit earlier in the SDLC due to the nature of these kind of defects. Architecture review, design reviews, threat modeling, and again, peer review with any kind of documentation that we have early on. Where do we mainly find bugs and flaws? If we revert again to the SDLC, the graph that uh, Matthias presented at the start of the session, we map those phases again. So architecture and risk analysis, code review, spend testing, and threat modeling. Well, naturally, uh, whenever we start developing code, those bugs are going to uh, arise. We hope to spot them quite early on, maybe even the developer himself in the IDE. But even before this, if we do an architectural risk analysis, there's a whole class of flaws that we can hopefully weep out of the, of the documentation. And then threat modeling, there might be a difference in whatever was specified at the start during the requirements and design phase. So we might need to review that again uh, from a higher level later in the SDLC, even after development, do a step of threat modeling, and then identify, hopefully, not too many uh, additional flaws. But that's typically where you can identify these two classes of defects. Also, for, for, for flaws, threat modeling is also very good. Um, it's, it's just a good idea if you build something, or mainly if something is already in production, uh, you do not have the option to do it earlier because it's already there. So. Um, threat modeling, you just have to also make sure that you threat model the systems that are, are already in production. Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> pop quiz to see who is already asleep or not yet, hopefully. So this says watermelon. Not sure if you ever go to the grocery store or you open the fridge uh, at home. This is not a watermelon. <laughs> Sorry? It's not right. <laughs> yeah, maybe it was. Then it doesn't end up on the slide at all. Who thinks this is a bug? Yeah, okay, it depends, that's also interesting. Let's cover that in a second. Who thinks it's a flaw? Okay, why would it depend? Well, I mean, if it was just, let's say, done by one individual who just misidentified a cop and put the wrong state, yeah. then it's a bug. Correct. But if it was, let's say, the production line that is uh, putting uh, consistently watermelon on this uh, cabbage, then I think it's a design problem. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. Indeed, I think it's a bit more leaning towards a bug because let's hope that, of course, that doesn't happen for all the whatever kind of vegetable this is. Um, but okay, that's good feedback. Bug or flaw? This one? That's definitely a flaw for you. Can you elaborate? This is not something that you construct in the this, this was done during the design. Do you think in the design there was actually two? <laughs> <laughs> the, the bridge was designed like this, like let's build this bridge that doesn't connect. <laughs> it's me, it's, 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 it's maybe. <laughs> if it's a bug, it's a really, really Who got fired, you think? The engineer or the person that developed, that, that designed the bridge? Uh, boats, probably. <laughs> Uh, I, I also think it leans a bit more towards, uh, in this case, a bug. I really hope that the plans of the bridge, before they got validated, didn't have this in there. But you can see the sheer horror in the face of the engineers. I hope, I hope it's not real, actually. Yeah, I have no idea. I hope not. <laughs> Would be quite costly. Uh, bug or flaw? This is maybe a bit more difficult already. 
Depends. Burge as usual. <laughs> usual, okay. <laughs> Very buggy and flawed. Can you elaborate why you think it's maybe both? Then it's uh, a flaw, but if they just plan to put it somewhere on there, yeah. then it, it might have meant to be in the middle, and then it's just like. Yeah, exactly. It, it can even happen that we have two designs that conflict. This looks pretty okay without this cycle pod. On the other way around, this also looks pretty okay for two way traffic if the poles wouldn't be there. So it could even be that the construction worker implemented this perfectly right. But yeah, two design plans and that wasn't raised. Let's hope that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But it's still a, a possibility. I think this is the last one. It's a very typical case of a, an insecure copying of one buffer to another. I think we all agree here that it's a bug, right? Uh, probably the intention of the developer is not to do this insecurely to a smaller, uh, a smaller array, a smaller buffer size. Uh, for anyone who's still figuring out what is happening, so buffer A, 50 characters, is copied to buffer B that is quite a bit smaller, 16 characters, so there's a potential for an overflow there. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, uh, this could also be quite, uh, quite flawed, yeah. <laughs> Just get rid of it, so don't commit it. Okay. So application security testing, um, and I'll try to not rush through it, but, but give enough time uh, for the, the static analysis part. Um, so we have an application. We can either decide we're going to look only at source code, what Matthias quickly mentioned before, or we're going to look both at the source code and the compiled version. Uh, in the first case, we have pure static analysis, uh, security testing, so SAST. On the other hand, we have the dynamic counterpart, DEST, so dynamic application security testing. A few pros and cons, I think you might have hands-on experience with, uh, with these. So the static part, it's pretty good to pinpoint bugs exactly. Well, why? Due to the nature of static analysis, <laughs> either using a tool or manually, you're going to run through code. So you know exactly if you identify a bug, where it's located. Implementing a fix can go pretty quickly. Well, probably around the vicinity of the identified bug, you'll need to implement that fix most of the time. There's quite a few automated uh, solutions available. We give a short demo of that uh, in a few slides. You can even spot issues before the code is compilation ready. I think that's a very good point for static analysis. Um, if you want to start doing this kind of analysis prior to release, prior to completion uh, of a single module or the entire application, you can already start running through snippets of code uh, and spot these bugs early on. On the other hand, it's time consuming. You're running through source code, you're setting up the tools. Uh, it's no longer a black box, so you need to spend quite some effort on understanding what's, what's going on. And it requires thorough understanding of the entire code base. Um, it completely ignores certain time vulnerabilities, so any factors that might impact the application, how it behaves, um, uh, inputs and outputs that are um, triggering the application, well, that's going to be invisible. You, ne you need to take that into account. Very difficult to go to review. Well, it's going to be quite difficult to spot bugs if you see this kind of SQL statements, and that's a single select. By the way, all the examples are taken some way or another from popular uh, software that we find on public repositories. Uh, another one. So sanitizing uh, input variables, well, who knows what is happening here? And I assure you there is no comment at all in the source code to explain it. These kind of horror um, package declarations, function names can make it quite difficult to understand what's going on. Assertions that are happening without a really good explanation. This piece, I think, is extracted from uh, OpenSSL. I'm not sure if you've ever looked, you recognize it. Yeah. You're saying, yes, that could be correct. This could go on the slide. Um, quite a bit of the publicly available packages or software components that are really often used are just extremely difficult due to legacy reasons to review. Um, so it's a bit the misconception. I think we're getting a bit better at that now, that everything that's open source will be vetted by a lot of people. That's definitely not the case. Um, see a lot of smiles here. 
people might recognize a few of the horror stories. That's my obfuscation. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> obfuscation, even for the reviewers. So well, one thing I would like to add here is, um, and the hard bleed bug is, and, and because you're going to open source and, and talking a little bit about that, the hard bleed bug is also uh, in, in a package where, where the source is available. And, and actually, uh, companies are, are scanning that, 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 that code and figuring out if it's secure or not. Um, it's interesting to see that they didn't even spot that particular problem in the code. And, and the question raises like, well, if so many people are looking at it, like these, these solutions are looking at, why didn't they find the code? Well, the thing is, if, if, if you write something like that, if you, if you make it that complicated, if you make it such a spaghetti code that even uh, uh, an, an automated tool is not able to figure out if there are problems or not, I think you have a really, really, really big problem. It, it, because how can you understand this piece of code if even an automated solution cannot, cannot even understand the code? So if the complexity is that big that um, these algorithms are not able to find that particular rather simple problem in the code, um, then I think it's fairly impossible for a human to go that. So I think that, that's, I th I think that, that that's one of the, the basic things, like try to make it as simple as possible so that you can understand it, so that a tool can go through it. Um, don't, don't write stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Just a small reaction. Yeah. yeah. From the Everybody is forgetting that OpenSSL was written hmm, just by some guys who yeah. they thought it was interested. And it's not their fault. Mm -hmm. No. It's the fault of the industry to take over such a code. And to adapt it. Yeah. They didn't want to invest in writing the same thing. Yeah, it's correct. They didn't get funding, I think, until a few years back. They didn't get a single dime yeah. from a lot of partners that. Yeah. I've been using that code for a long time. Yeah, was it a half a person yeah. that was on the project or something like that? And, and yeah. the entire world relies on that piece of code. It's just, yeah, it's unimaginable, right? Thanks for that. So the dynamic part, it's, it's a bit flipped, both columns, so I'll very quickly go through this. I think one of the important points here, the best advantages is the potential false sense of security. If you're doing a dynamic test, you're not going through the source code. Well, are you sure that all the execution paths are covered, right? So enumerating all those test cases uh, for a black box approach in a dynamic test, uh, that's quite difficult, so take that into account. Most of the time you're going to combine both techniques. It's uh, the same in, in, in every approach, I think. Both static and dynamic um, application security testing techniques are combined to create a full assessment, a full view on the, the security of the app. Most of these tools were already uh, highlighted quickly, so uh, Veracode, mm -hmm. Fortify, Clockwork, they were mentioned as static uh, automated analysis tools. Now on the dynamic part there is AppScan, HP Web Inspect, um, they are quite popular. Static analysis manually, well it's reading through the code, doing peer reviews, uh, the developer himself going through this code using the IDE. And dynamic analysis uh, in a real way, well, typically that's going to be stepping through the code yourself, attaching a debugger, trying a few uh, abuse cases, uh, and see, seeing what comes out of this. <coughs> an example of this, well, there's a few tools, both in .NET, um, as well as the Java development environment. I think we have a short demonstration of yeah. this in Objective C and Xcode, which we can uh, switch to now. So just to make, one second, so I'm gonna start with Xcode. Just to make sure that everybody has some sort of understanding of, of what a static analysis solution is, is capable of doing. And, and these are just tools that I found on the internet. Um, you can, can freely download these tools. Uh, one is called X uh, Security. Um, I, I think it was already presented at some OWASP meetings too. Um, and it goes through um, the iOS code. So if you activate it, what it actually does, this is in the IDE static analysis. So this is in the IDE that it's going to uh, check for certain things. Again, without executing, it's just going to inspect the code and it's going to give you some feedback. So it's going to say stuff like, hey, over here we're leaking information to the logs. Um, so if that contains sensitive information, you have to think about that. Um, insecure keychain storage. Um, so over here, the information is stored in the keychain with weak ex uh, uh, accessibility options. So this is what static analysis is. So just for people who do not really have a good understanding of what static analysis really is, it's just you have the code and it's going to give you feedback in the IDE. This is one type of, of static analysis. 
and this is for, for Xcode. For Eclipse, um, there's, there's a solution called CodePro that, I've, that I found and that I, that I ran on this. Um, it's just on, on, our, our, on our sample application. Uh, it's a banking application with, with a, lot of, a lot of problems. You can, I think, hit it with a right click and say Code Pro Tools. I just want to uh, check this code, uh, audit the code. And once you do that, it, at, at the bottom over here, it gives you stuff like, hey, you know what? Um, there's a potential command execution problem in this piece of code. So, sorry, it's a little bit small. Um, so over here, what it says, like, hey, um, with, with runtime exec, this particular API, if you use this API, you can be vulnerable to uh, command execution. Um, so just to have a, a look and feel of, of what a static analysis solution is capable of doing. By the way, that's our own source code. It's not of one of our clients, just no. to be clear for the record. <laughs> it's our own sample <laughs> banking up. Yeah. So there's, there's also a few standalone tools. HP Fortify, IBM AppScan is here. Not going to showcase those. So which techniques are we going to use to um, detect flaws? Which ones are we going to use to detect bugs? Well, typically, the bugs can be automated. You're going to uh, do automated code analysis review techniques. You can do a part manually for the very security sensitive parts. But this is really the, the low hanging fruit that you can identify with the kind of tools that Matthias uh, highlighted. Flaws, it's still a lot of manual work earlier on in the, in the SDLC. Architectural risk analysis um, is a very important step there. Uh, Gardner, well, there's a few key players here on the, uh, on the leader quadrant. So that's H HP, IBM, thanks, Veracode, and White Hat Security. They offer both dynamic and static uh, solutions. There's also a bit of a trend towards uh, interactive application security testing where an agent is installed um, on the web server and it's going to report back to the tool uh, with live diagnostics, so that's quite powerful. Um, I think for the sake of time, we yep. can switch, switch to, to the, the next, next section. section. So, so I'm, I'm going, going to, to hand, hand back, back to, uh, to, uh, to Matthias for this. this. Thanks a lot, Dan. So a little bit about the, the static analysis theory. Um, let's, let's go a level deeper. Um, if, if you look from a 10,000 feet view at a static analysis yeah. solution, what, what does it really do? So an automated solution, what does it do? So essentially what it does is it takes your code, which can be written in different languages, Java, C, whatever you call it, and it's gonna create some intermediate language. It's gonna create some intermediate language um, to perform an analysis, all right? The idea is over there that, well, if you, if you write a, a, an analysis engine, well, and if you create an intermediate language, you can perform analysis on, on an infinite number of uh, languages, right? You only have to make sure you translate it to the intermediate language and then the analysis will just work fine for that particular language. Important over here is, is the brain. You still have to tell the analysis solution what it has to find, okay? You can do some analysis, it can run, but if you don't tell an analysis engine what it needs to look for, well, you will not have any results, right? Okay, in the end, uh, you're going to create a report and you're going to present that back to the user. Um, how does that really work? Uh, the first phase is really the translation phase where you take the code and you build up some graph. This can be a graph um, for, for uh, data flow analysis, it can be for control flow analysis, it can be like, hey, how does components interact with each other, or it can be just an XML file that, that you just parse and that you, that you create this particular graph. So you, it's not one graph. In the internals of a static analysis solution, they are not building up one particular graph. They're building up several different graphs and they are performing analysis on different graphs or even a combination of, of the graphs. Afterwards, that is really the phase two, they are going to scan that graph. So they're gonna take the graph and language specific, these rules, they're gonna apply to the analysis and they're gonna say, well, look for this, look for that. Um, in, in, a, in a scenario like um, look for dangerous function, you can say like get s, don't use get s, and that's a particular rule. It only analysis is gonna uh, specify what to look for. So where can, where can stuff go wrong with the static analysis solution? Uh, why is a static analysis, analysis solution not perfect? Well, if you build up a graph and, and the graph is, is not really perfect, you're gonna miss results. It's, it's as simple as that. All right, and, and what that really means is like, 
Um, if you're if you're missing some oh one second I'm sorry if if you're missing some jar files if you do not include all the code in your uh, scanning solution you will not find all the uh, results in your code all right so you really have to make sure that that your solution is complete on the other hand you also have to make sure that you exclude code that you do not want to scan like for example um, testing code make sure you do not have test code when you scan it's it's kind of meaningless right you don't want to find the problems in your test code all right when you build up a, a model the tool will do as good as it can to make that perfect model. What's very important over here is that you have to check the documentation of, of the solution that you're using. For example, if it says like, hey, we, we can scan your application and we support struts and hibernate and all these packages. If, you, if you're using a jar file package XYZ, uh, which is not known to the vendor or which you bought, well, you have to take that into consideration. Okay, because that will create an imperfect model, right? It, it will create something which is imperfect and will, where you will lose issues. Um, I think that's yeah. your piece done. Yeah. Um, so the very small section on the limitations of static analysis, I think this is a bit a summary of what we're going to discuss here. We'll make sure we get to the, uh, to the next section. So I'll speed a bit through this. Um, what we're looking for, obviously, is the true negatives, the true positives. Uh, there's two big categories that we need to weep out, that we need to identify, basically by fine-tuning the scope of our tool and the technical configuration of the static analysis tools themselves. Um, even within the true positives, we have wanted results, the stuff that we really want to, to know as a company, that we want to fix, we want to spend effort remediating. On the other hand, there's quite a few unwanted results. We hear it often that there's a static analysis tool being used out of the box by the client. They say, well, we have 1,500 cases of XSS reported, but we are doing this in another component or we really don't care about this instance. Why do we see this? Well, all these tools uh, can be customized to exclude those. Clients sometimes get a bit angry by those really huge reports of, uh, of their static analysis tools. But tweaking those tools, that's really where, where the added value is. So very often at the start, we see a huge overwhelming amount of false positives. Um, in the beginning, you have no clue about the false negatives. For example, uh, if your tool only supports Java and .NET, if you're going to include an external library written in C that cannot be handled by the tool, it's very important to know that. You might need additional uh, manual review, you might require a peer review, maybe a vendor review uh, to, to check that off. But having a clue about false negatives, I think, is one of the most difficult parts of getting this right, but it's important to take <coughs> that uh, into account. So this is what you hopefully end up with, a bunch of true positives <coughs> that you can work your way through, uh, the wanted positives uh, that require some action from your end to, uh, to remediate, Understanding why there is hopefully a very small section that could fall under uh, false negatives uh, and then the false positives should be um, reduced mainly by fine-tuning the rules uh, and the model of your, uh, your static analysis tool. <coughs> we can very quickly go through this. Uh, typically false positives, um, you have an incomplete model of forgiving analysis which means it's a bit too loose. The matching of the rules should be a bit stricter. Those things can be definitely fine-tuned. Just a few examples. This will be uh, for your reference in the, the slide deck. One example that we encountered during static analysis of a test application that we wrote. In this case, the tool had no idea about struts. In the controller, there was a certain error property containing the username that was being sent directly to the view. And in the view, you had this annotation saying a struts action error escape equals false. So in some cases, it could, this could contain uh, special characters and it was vulnerable to cross-site scripting. The tool did not identify this. Why? Well, I had no clue about how struts works. If you want to catch this kind of things, your tool doesn't support it, well, it's very important to build up your model to give it a notion about struts in this case. So it completely ignored this, uh, this cross-site scripting instance. The result is a false negative. Right, triaging. 
So once you have a manage manageable number of false positives and once you understand the number of false negatives you have, um, you're in a good stage because the, the, the bulk of the work is essentially done. And, and not a lot of people understand that. They think, well, we really have to spend hours and hours going to triaging and stuff like that. Um, that is maybe true, but you have to make sure that it scales. You don't have to do that for every project and over and over and uh, over again. You really have to find a way to make it scale for your entire project, your entire organization. So these making manageable uh, buckets of false positives and really focus on the, on the true issues should be done in, in the right way. Once that's done, um, you're in a good stage. However, there, there's one big problem. Now comes really the hard part is like, how are we going to make sure that the issues get fixed? And, and over and over again, what we see at, at customers is really the fact that um, when you give a report, a static analysis a, a, a report to a developer, they're gonna challenge that. Because static analysis, as I said before, you're not executing the code, okay? And they're gonna challenge that. They're gonna say, well, this is all theoretical, you know? Um, show me that my stuff is broken. This is the a typical answer that you'll get from your developer. Show me that it is broken and then I'll fix it. And, and once you go down that cycle, once you really are going down that cycle and you're gonna to try to exploit a particular problem, you're really going into the, into the wrong direction of the discussion, okay? Because what you're gonna do is you're gonna waste a lot, a lot of time. Sometimes the fix is like a five second, six, five second fix. So why going through the, through the effort of trying to exploit something to prove that something is wrong and, and having really an argue with, with your peers within the organization? Um, what's much better is, is really think about the flow and flow and really try to make a secure solution, really making sure that security is incorporated into your, into your code. That should be the goal of, of everybody, not challenging each other. Um, it's, it's very hard to do, and I, I do understand that, that in a lot of organizations, they constantly have that challenge, but once you go down that route, it's really hard to, get, get, to take a step back and, and, and be friends with everybody. So um, what, what, what's a really better approach, and, this is essentially saying the obvious is really read the evidence, understand the category, and see if the evidence uh, really supports the problem category. And, and, and some, most of the times it's, it's fairly obvious, right? And, and do the right thing, take appropriate action, um, and, and not try to go down that route to finding an exploit. I, I, I really uh, hope that you're not going to do that because it, it's something once you start uh, some static analysis solution are simply thrown out because, uh, because of that, of having that discussion. Some, some more information around the theory and, and this may be already be a little bit more advanced. Um, static analysis theory, as I said before, within a static analysis solution, you're building up different graphs and then you're performing different analysis on these particular graphs. These are a handful of examples of different analyzers that you can use within a static analysis solution. Um, I think some organizations or some, some commercial uh, products have like 10 analyzers, others have 15, so uh, that's a little bit the number of analyzers they have internally. Um, interesting question is like, why are you talking about analyzers? Just give us the results and, and get over with it and, and let's, let's just fix the stuff. But, uh, very interestingly enough is if you want to fine tune, and uh, that word uh, came up during, during the introduction, if you want to fine tune your static analysis solution, you can't do that without any knowledge about the solution itself. So you really have to understand a little bit the basics of how this works internally to make sure that you can optimize it for your organization, okay? So you have to know what analyzer find what kind of issue to fix problems, to, to fine tune your solution. Um, if you don't understand that there's more than one analyzer and I think everything is produced by the same analyzer, it's very hard to fine tune your solution. All right, let's start with the simplest one, which is just structural matching. Uh, the simplest static ana analyzer is, is essentially a grab function, right? That's, that's structural matching. You just grab for a string copy over here, 
Um, I'll just go through that. You're just going to grab for string copy over here. You know all the places where string copy is used and then you're going to work your way through that. Um, other categories, very similar, that can be found by structural matching or like uncheck return value. You can make a regex that says like, hey, this particular API always have to return something and you need to check that. Um, functions that should not be used like str string copy. Passwords, a very good one. Passwords over there, passwords that are set to null. Um, how can you do that with a grep? You may ask yourself like, hey, how, how do you do that with a, with a grep function? So in, 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 in a lot of these cases, the variables for passwords have, have a definite name, like password or, or password or, or mode of pass or whatever in your language is password. Um, and if you just grab for that word, you'll find a lot of results already. Okay, so you can figure out if the password is used in the correct way, if it's set to null, if it's hard coded, or is it, or if it's empty. You can also find SQL injection with that, and you may ask yourself, well, it's SQL injection. This is the very, very basic step on how to find SQL injection. Um, what do you do over here? Well, over here, you're going to point out every place in your application that the query gets executed against the database. So every API that has that functionality, you can grab on. Okay, so if you're really, really thorough and you do not want to uh, invest a lot of money into uh, a static analysis solution, you can simply use grep, figure out all the places in your application that uh, a query gets executed against the database, and you can make sure that uh, uh, you're using parameterized queries over there and stuff like that. So this is very basic. Um, the next step, well, the next step, really what, what makes static analysis so good, the automated solution, is, is, is really taint tracking. Um, taint tracking is really the most important uh, analyzer in a static analysis solution. Um, what is taint tracking? Well, as I said before, you can find SQL injection by just grabbing. A better approach is really try to figure out how data moves through your application, figure out if it can come from a user or a malicious person, and if it can end up in a place where it can do bad things. I call it just bad things. So a very simple example is get parameter, you get something uh, from a user, so that user can put whatever in here and it goes to the parameter. It flows through your application and you're going to keep, try to keep track of that. Remember, this is static analysis. This is not executing your code. This is just building up a model and, and trying to figure out if this is in theory possible. You're just going to track that particular variable through your application and if it ends up in an API where it can do bad things like command line execute, you're going to throw an issue and you can give a lot of evidence. Okay, You can give a lot of evidence where you can say, hey, this particular path can be taken through your application and it can end up into the command line .execute. So this can really be a command execution. How do we call this? We call this a source of taint, we call this pass-throughs, and we call this sinks, just for terminology. Um, source of taint, um, internally, and th this is also very interesting, so source of taint, um, examples of source of taint is really like uh, queries that, that so, so the, the, the return value from the execution of a query against the database. So, Essentially, you can say everything that's in a database can come from a user because they can first put something in the database and later on use that information from within that database to do malicious things. Get parameters, stuff that comes from the web, an environment variable, uh, reading from a stream, uh, framework APIs, um, server information, and uh, also sensitive information coming from the database. So really, you want to want to keep track of that. And this is very interesting because some people say, well, we do not find all the issues in our code. And, and why is that? Because sometimes they are using a framework over here that is taking information in and the static analysis solution does not know about it. Okay, if you have a specific framework uh, that you're using to get information into your application, that a static analysis solution is not aware of, well, then it's, of course, impossible to keep track of, of the information. Pass-throughs, so how does it flow through an application? Um, just in code, so it can, you can move some strings, so if everything is in code, the static analysis solution, by default, will keep track of it. 
However, it becomes interesting when a uh, API is called which goes to the outside, which is no longer in your own source code. And over there, you really have to make a distinction between source code anal analysis and, and, and binary uh, code analysis or, or intermediate uh, code analysis. So in, in really source code analysis, um, you need additional information to mimic that particular behavior. If your source code is not there, you need that information in your model or otherwise it's not modeled in the right way. If you're doing binary analysis or, or intermediate language analysis, it depends on, on how much information is in your application. Sinks, where can stuff go, where can things go wrong? Well, really where things can go wrong is really, uh, you just enumerate the, the categories of, of, of vulnerabilities and you figure out where these things can happen, like SQL injection, all the APIs that execute information against the database. Cross-site scripting, everything that's written back into the HTML page. Command injection, executing stuff on the command line, and so on and so forth. So these are the points where bad things can happen. Uh, configuration file analysis, so what, what you can do with configuration file analysis is really, it's very simple. This one is very simple. It, it takes the XML uh, file of your configuration file and it's going to parse through it and it's going to try to find out if everything is set the right way. So also for your organization, easy to customize. You should be able to make sure that the parameters are set according to your standards. Uh, uh, one thing that you can use over there is really XPath, that, that's, that's the common uh, 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 parser that you can use for, for uh, traversing through XML documents. Control flow analysis. Another one is, is how can you find, for example, problems like a stream that was not closed? And, and over there, we're gonna, you, internally, they're going to use a state machine. So you also have to know that, that state machines are used within a static analysis solution. And if you know that, you can do a better reasoning on why issues are showing up or why issues are simply missing. In this scenario, the state machine, if you open a stream, you're, you're, you're in the file open stream state. And then what some people forget is, is that exceptions can happen and that the stream will not be closed if an exception happens. So this is why a static analysis solution is finding issues or not finding issues. And also these problems that go with that. So like for example, um, you know you can open a stream by, by using streams, by using writers, or by using readers. If you forgot about that, or if the people that wrote the static analysis solution forgot about that, well then they will simply not find this particular problem. So there may be a problem in your code that you're not finding through your static analysis solution, because simply the information is, 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 is limited and is, is not entirely up to date. All right. Um, I, I think I have still 10 minutes? Yeah, we have about eight uh, minutes left. Eight minutes left. All right. So how do you inform developers? Um, that's a very interesting question. You know, so how, if you find your issues and, and there is a problem, how are you going to inform your developers? I've, I've already said like, hey, try to avoid the fight with your developers on, on, on uh, is, is this a real issue or is, is this not a real issue? Um, but essentially, an, 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 another additional thing that you can do to inform your developers is how are you going to present the results to your developers, okay? And there are essentially three ways. No, normally there are three ways. If there are more, please let me know. But, but I know about three ways, which is first of all, you create a report, a PDF, and you give that to your developer and you say, hey, here are the issues, fix them. You're gonna use the, the bug tracking system that's already in place. Bugzilla, whatever kind of bug tracking system you're using, and you're just gonna add the problems in the bug tracking system and developers will fix that. Or in, in, in some cases, vendors are also offering an IDE uh, to show these particular problems um, and, and your developers can use that particular IDE. The first one, a report. Um, what's good about the report? Well, it's, it's very simple to do. It's just a click of the button and you create a report and you can give that to developers. Um, unfortunately, uh, developers will not like this. They will, and, and, and this is very unfortunate because I see a lot of organization, organizations 
introducing the developers to a static analysis solution in this particular way because it's so simple, you know, it's just a click of a button, you create a report, you give it to developers and you're like done. Um, however, developers will really, really struggle with the report. Um, why is that? The report is not interactive. Um, for Think about um, uh, the, the, the taint analysis where you go through your application if you have to put that into a report and if, if it goes through 10 or 15 functions, you really have pages and pages of code on, on the evidence and this is very, very hard for a developer, you know. Then he has to map that particular report back to his own code and figure out what's going on. So very, very, very hard. Um, no possibility to regroup. Um, some issues are, are one and the same issue. Uh, so there's no possibility for him to, to figure out another way to group these particular issues and fix in bulk, essentially, like try to fix one thing, and by fixing one thing, you will essentially eliminate a whole range of problems, right? Um, no tuning possibilities. There's no way for the developer uh, to say, well, I would, I would like the analysis to behave this or that way. Um, all in all, developers, it's, it's a very bad way to introduce developers to a static analysis solution by just throwing a report uh, at their desk. Bug tracking system, um, I think this is really the ideal way to roll it out into an organization because a bug tracking system, uh, your developers are already familiar with, with the bug tracking system, right? And it's just another bug in their queue. Also, <coughs> normally they get time assigned to fix bugs, right? So if it's, if it's a functional bug or, or a security bug, they get time assigned. So the developers are happy because it's not something additional on their plate. No, it's already worked into the process and they already uh, have time assigned to go through these bugs. If it's functional security, it doesn't matter, okay? Uh, the cons over here, um, <clears throat> again, grouping is, is, is really hard if it's pushed in one way into the, into the bug tracking system. Uh, that's pretty much it. And there's limited wiggle room for, for tuning uh, the bugs. Um, what I mean with that is like um, a developer cannot fine tune how the system will behave and what kind of problems it will find. <coughs> Last but not least, um, it's, it's the vendor provided solution. So really a GUI provided by the vendor. Um, What's really interesting over there is that the GUI is, is essentially made to, to view security issues. So that, that's really good about it. If you have, but this is more for mature organizations, I would say. So if you're, if you're very mature, if you're doing static analysis for a long time, your developers are, are totally on board with that. They get it, they understand it. Um, then this is an ideal way to, to take the next step, you know, to make it more mature, where the developers can really use the IDE of the vendor, they can play around with it, there's a lot of information, they can regroup, they can even fine tune the issues, they can even uh, make sure the tool really finds the issues the developer and the organization is interested in. So with that, I think we still have five minutes for, for Q&A, or three minutes for, for, for Q&A. Um, with that, is there something that I didn't touch on that, that came from, from the, uh, introductions. I, I, I hope I, I try to steer this a little bit in, into the questions like, hey, how can you fine tune a, a solution? Uh, how can you roll out the solution? Um, any other questions around static analysis around this presentation? The, the last part. Yes. Um, the, there is another approach which is kind of a hybrid between uh, the second and the third. Yes. And that's uh, integrating the problems in the IDE of the developers uh, yep. so they don't have to learn another new uh, interface that's directly integrated in the IDE they're used to. Uh, yes, uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. I, 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 I think that's very close to what the, the vendors provide this particular solution, right? Uh, or normally the vendor provides the, the plugin for Eclipse or, or not, I can be wrong, or that's, that's what you mean, right? Yeah, uh, that's something we're, we're trying to, to, to build for us for the moment. Because we're using Sonar Cube to yep. use the Sonar Cube plugin for Eclipse, so the developer really doesn't have to leave his development environment. Yep. To and so you're, you're, you, you have your bug in, in the bug tracking system, and they can click and it goes up in the. Or yes. how does it work? So we've got a central Sonar Cube server. Yes, uh, okay. Which, um, does the static analysis uh, on the SVN, if 
repository. Yep. Um, the profiles of static analysis are um, configured by a specialized team. Yes. Uh, and upon each build, uh, there's an analysis, an analysis which is run, which is synchronized with the IDE of the developer. Okay, but again, so well, the yeah. developer is coding in his code the issues that Sonar finds yep. are marked in his mm. code. Yeah. Okay, and yeah, but then the, I think the developers all, are already on board with the whole solution because it, it can be seen as like an additional thing on their plate to also fix security issues. Um, okay, that, that's very good feedback. Thank you. Yeah, fine, fine books is fairly limited. Um, from, from my experience, um, it, it's, it's the first of a, I cannot really call this a first generation static analysis solution, but, but fine books is, is fairly limited. Um, and I also know like fine books is also integrated with, with other commercial um, uh, uh, solutions. I just have to think now, uh, isn't fine bugs finding more quality issues than security yeah, it's issues? More issues it's more quality yeah. issues, right? Uh, yeah, but the, I think the focus is more quality than security. Yeah. And um, it, it's sometimes incorporated with commercial solutions where you can switch it on and off based on your preference. If you think you can, one way or the other, you can think about it as another analyzer. Um, if, you, if you add it to your commercial solution, you can say, well, does FindBug give me a lot of um, good stuff? Then you can switch it on. Does it give, does not give me good stuff? You can switch it off. So all these analyzers, if, if you're really down there, you can, you can really fine tune these analyzers and say, well, this whole range of issues that is found by this particular analyzer, I do care about that, or I would like to have, give it a higher priority or a lower priority. So you can, you can really play around with that. Uh, sonar cube, um, but I thought it was the also. Way does, um, try to do data flow analysis. Okay, so I do not know sonar cube all too well to be to be honest. I, it, it will find certain problems with data flow. Um, does it, does it have the quality angle or is it more the security? It depends on how you configure it. Fine books. So yeah. you've got fine books profiles that are uh, very much focused on, on quality of code. Yeah. You've got specific profiles which search for security flaws, yeah. uh, which concentrates, for example, on, on finding SQL injections. Yeah. yeah, I thought Sonar Cube was more focused on 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 quality. And the the thing is, in the market, you you have a lot of well, you have a lot. That's not true. You had a couple of companies that really took the the security angle, mm -hmm. and then said, well. Oh, it's interesting, but also let's add a little bit of quality issues so that the developers are, are happy, essentially, that it's more for security people, but that developers also have something. And, and if, you, if they took that angle, uh, the, the, the ounces, the, the, the fortifies, they took that angle, their idea was really to find as many vulnerabilities as possible and then afterwards fine tune. Then you have also the, the, the quality tools and their uh, idea was, well, it's for developers. It really has to be right. We really have to find these issues and they all have to be right because otherwise we're gonna piss off the developers. And that was really the idea. And then they saw like, well, there's also money to be made in security, so let's add some rules to do also security. Um, so all you find is good stuff, um, but it, it's normally not that heavy on, on customization and stuff like that. Uh, you can customize a lot of the rules for, for which searches, but it's, it's less sophisticated than yeah. fortified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or then on swaps. Yeah. Yes. Final question, and then we're 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 staying here for a little bit after the session. So feel free to. So more in the beginning of the uh, presentation, you mentioned that uh, static analyzers they build graphs and then they analyze the graphs. Yes. And I was wondering how many graphs do they build? Because I only know one type of graph, and it's a code graph, and then you analyze the code. Yes. But uh, yeah, so, so dependency graphs, uh, uh, control flow graph, uh, also just 
Um, you can also say like you, you just parse an XML file and, and they're going to build up a graph on that too. So um, it depends a little bit on how what the definition of a graph is, but they, they build up different models. Uh, you can also think about it as, as a model on, on how you can model something and based on that model, you're going to try to do an analysis and find some issues that, that fit that particular model. But it's, uh, it's always about the codes. So you build different graphs yes. on the same code? Yes. Yes, absolutely, yes. It's different graphs on the same code that you're building. Um, it's just a different angle on how to look at, how to look at the code. Um, all right, thank you very much.